You are listening to I Am Refocused Radio with your host, Shamaya Reed. This show is designed to inspire you to live your purpose and regain your focus. And now, here's your host, Shamaya Reed. Hey, welcome to I Am Refocused Radio. We are here once again. And today, man, we have another show lined up for y'all today. I mean, t- today we're going to talk to a, a author and, and someone who has an awesome story because he's not just an author, he's an attorney. He's an advocate for social justice for all people. He's a social worker, a carpenter. And man, he's the one and only Will Pardue. And he's going to talk to us about his his amazing book. I'll give you the website real fast. It's real easy. WJP books.com. And today is all about his book, Wolf Creek. And first and foremost, man, I just want to welcome you, Will, to the show. So how you doing, man? I'm doing good. And you can call me Bill. Okay, Bill. Okay, Bill. Appreciate that. So we'll make Bill, this casual. <laughs> <laughs> so Bill, man, kind of give us this story. It's a very interesting story. You you end up going somewhere where you play a heavy role in, in helping people, uh, young people who actually really need the help. So kind of gives the backstory of this book. Right. So um, I graduated from college in 71 during the you know, height of the uh, racial tensions and the hippies and the Vietnam War, all that stuff. And I just happened to find a, a job at the university posted on the board for a wilderness um, camping counselor. And uh, I thought, you know, I really like to do outdoor stuff. I like to go camping and hiking and canoeing and mountain climbing, all that stuff. So I thought it'd be a, you know, a cool job uh, right out of school because I was what, 21. And it turned out to be, I, I was interviewed by the social worker and he told me that this was for emotionally disturbed, delinquent teenagers, which meant that these were boys that had been through, most of them were from South Side of Chicago. They had been involved in gangs. Uh, there were some that were not, but they all had a violent past or troubled past. And the, um, the city of um, Chicago could not handle them in their juvenile system. The uh, state of Illinois could not handle them. They sent them to Texas, to the Boys Ranch in Texas, and they couldn't handle them. So they came up with this idea back at that in that day and age where everything was being creative. They were starting things new of sending them out in the woods in a wilderness to live. This was not just uh, we're going on a weekend camp. This was living in the woods. And uh, they bought 20 acres out in East Texas, which was a very conservative, um, and and if I can say, you know, bluntly a racist part of Texas. And uh, again, half of our um, young men were uh, black and the other half were white. Um, So we were dumped into the middle of that. They basically took us out there, took them out there and uh, and dumped us all in on this acreage, which is unimproved. Just had a dirt road going into it, ended into a bunch of trees. And, um, you know, we had to fend for ourselves. We had to, to make make the rules and, and keep the kids from killing each other and killing counselors. Um, so after my first interview, you know, my first encounter with them, because we they really didn't tell us the entire picture, because if they did, most people wouldn't want the job. Um, the uh, the first things we heard right before they came out was that one of the boys was a um, an animal mutilator, right? He had cut the legs off of a dog, put it under his bed. He had, wow. uh, you know, set put a, a torch up a horse's nose, and he and he also uh, abused the, the the other boys. The first night he was in camp, he heated up a bow saw and went and put it right on the back of uh, of one of the campers. Um, so my first uh, contact with the boys was they came. We were staying out at a state park, waiting for him to come. We'd heard all the stories. We hadn't seen him yet. And they drove up in an old um, a school bus. And there were 10 of them, and then there were two counselors for each group. Uh, the first group was myself, and then there was a Vietnam vet who was a uh, 101st Airborne um, 
and he had been he had left the military and he was out with me helping to contain these boys and his help was definitely necessary so these boys come tumbling off the bus one of them's thrown out of the bus and after that the leader of the group comes off first and and his first lieutenant comes off next and we're sitting at a, a table picnic table and i'm sitting on the end of one side and the other counselor is sitting on the end of the other side and the leader of the group well they all pile on the picnic table and they start you know how it is a bunch of guys get together they start trying to push me off the end of the table mm-hmm. and uh, the leader sits across from me lights up a cigarette and he, and he uh, leans over the table and blows it in my face blows the smoke in my face and at that time, I was, um, you know, a young man. I had, I had been raised fighting with my brothers and everybody else that wanted to fight. So I was not, you know, a, a foreigner to a fight. And I said to him, I said, look, um, you know, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you one more chance. I'll give you one free pass. Just don't ever do that again. So, of course, what does he do? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tested you. Right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> And there used to be a test, and they're used to testing people. So he goes across the table, blows smoke in my face, and I'm across that table in two seconds. Knocked him off. We're both rolling down the hill because it, you know, there's a steep hill on one side. And you couldn't, you couldn't um, hurt the boys. You could only contain them, right? Because once you start punching, then that's what the whole thing's going to look like the entire time you're there. And I was there a year and a half. So you had to be able to contain them from not only hurting you, but hurting anybody else. And you had to gain control. So this was the leader of the gang. And that was it was important what I did with that leader. And what I did was like got him down, got him in a headlock, held him on the ground, sat on him for a while until he cooled off. And that's what you had to do with these boys. It wasn't a fist fight. It wasn't physically throwing them against something or hitting them with anything. It was just containment. And uh, once you contain them and sat on them long enough, you could see the anger just dissipate, right? It just came out of them. They they said everything they could say, and they just kind of walked off exhausted. So he did that. Before he left, he threatened me. He said, you know what, dude, I'm going to come to your tent tonight because we were sleeping in tents at that point. And I've got an ax, and I'm going to kill you. So you better better be ready for that. I said, you know, I mean, what are you going to do? You're out in the woods, right? Nobody there to, to, to really help you. Um, so it's all on you. This is what you do determines. And this was the this was the boys interview, right? If I didn't pass this interview, they, they didn't want me there. So um, I said that, you know, that's fine, dude, if that's what you think you have to do, but I'll be waiting for you. So within 10 minutes, now the, the enforcer, right? The guy who's the strongest member of the group that enforces things for the leader comes over and starts whacking one of the smaller kids in the head, just punched him in the head. And I'm saying, whoa, 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 that's not all right. Can't do it. Of course, he keeps doing it. Same thing again. He and I are rolling down the hill. I finally get him contained enough. But the important part of that first interview is it took the leader completely out of the picture because he was no longer the alpha male. And he knew it and everybody else knew it. So that particular member of that group could no longer be in the group because he got no respect from the members. He had no position that he had established before that had been taken from them. So they had to to look to me. They didn't know who I was. So, um, so that was my interview and I passed that. And um, they really didn't. you know, they didn't accept me. It was, a, it was a couple of months. So what we did, this was the deal. So you're out in the woods, you have no electricity, you have no water, you have no bathrooms, uh, you, you have nothing, right? No phones. Back in those days, we weren't cell phones. So you were just isolated. Whatever went on in camp was based on what the leaders, the two counselors, um, uh, set as the rules. And if they didn't like them, then that was too bad. So the first probably month and a half that they were there, they were always running away. And because it was so far out in the woods, it was difficult for them to get away before we could track them. I used a couple of little boys to track them down, would always bring them back. And after we did that for um, 
you know, a month and a half, they realize they're not going to go anyplace that I'm not going to find them and bring them back. Um, and the reason they put them out in the woods was they couldn't live with people. They couldn't live with regular people because they would hurt them. Uh, for a short period in the beginning, we had to be at a state park. And the same boy who was um, mutilating animals had disappeared for the day into the park. And we had the uh, park ranger pull up to the park and say, are, you, are all you guys here? Because somebody broke into a camp down the road sliced open the back of it, went in and, and uh, smeared peanut butter all over the women's underwear and stuck a knife between the legs of a doll. And he said, would any of your boys do anything like that? And I didn't know where, he, you know, I'd just known him for a couple of weeks at this point. So um, we all got together. I said, look, guys, we need to split up in twos. We need to find him, bring him back here and find out what happened. So they found him after an hour or two. He's up in a tree. And, and that's what he had done. I mean, he was he was a young serial killer. You know, that's what they do. They start mutilating animals. He's very difficult to get to, to talk to. And uh, so that's kind of what I was faced with on, on my first job out of college. Man, that sounds like a movie. Like. I'm just picturing everything in my head and so many questions come to mind. Like one, how did you survive? I want to know, uh, did that guy, uh, young man, did he actually come to your tent or did he kind of brush that off? Uh, you know, I, I think what happened, I don't know. I was waiting for him. You know, I, I've been threatened by lots of people a lot of times. Um, and he had already been publicly humiliated. So he had to say something like that, right? There had to be some sort of a boast, something left in him. Yeah. <clears throat> but the other counselor who had, who had been with these boys for a while realized what had happened and that he had all of a sudden lost his place in the group. So that counselor took him under his wing while I took the rest of the group because I now was their leader, whether they liked it or not. You know, I was the alpha male amongst those teenage boys. And uh, and once the leader was out of the way, then they then they had to look to me for some guidance. How did I survive? Because I survived with four brothers who were always trying to beat the hell out of you. <laughs> Brother, <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you've grown up with brothers, but yeah. And the one closest to me was always trying to kill me one way or another. Tried to electrocute me when I was small, tried to, you know, just things. So that prepared me for this. And that part of it, I, I didn't really mind because I was used to it. Uh, and people have asked me before, why didn't you just leave? Hmm. And the reality is, is that in my entire life, I, I try to follow what the universe wants me to do. Um, some people call it God and, and the universe may in fact be God. But I listen to the messages that are coming to me. And I was, I was supposed to be there. I was supposed to be the one who tamed these boys and did something productive with them. And when you look back, I mean, obviously we want people, people get the book Wolf Creek, uh, must read, get it anywhere like Amazon. But when you look back, uh, did you reach people, uh, those young men, were there, any like change of heart where they're like, you know what, I needed, you know, this tough love, if you will, you know, I needed this guidance. And uh, did you have anyone come to you and say, you know what, like, you know, thank you, you know, for basically, you know, showing leadership or just showing me, you know, a, a new path, if you will. Yeah, I mean, that was the thing about that. It was so rewarding to just see. And, and you know, again, they can't, they can't live in a civilized setting. So really, the idea of putting them out in the woods and making them entirely dependent on each other for survival, that, that made them turn a corner that they hadn't faced before, because now they were responsible and I was making them responsible and the other counselors were making them responsible. And uh, 
And so they learned some responsibility. That was the first thing they learned. And as it went on, uh, we really grew into a family, you know, a family of men. And we all loved each other. We all uh, um, counted on each other when we got into to problems. And the, and the perfect example of that is when they, when they finally, 100% of them came over to my side. We were in Dallas and uh, we had gone through the fairgrounds and we had parked the bus in a back alley and there was only one way out. And two of my boys, the two of the, and you, you can't hold your hand and walk them through the fairgrounds. These guys are out of the bus. They're gone. Uh, they're going to come back. You know that because they, they know where their free meal is. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, so they come running around the corner. We're all in the back alley getting in the bus. They come running around the corner and they're yelling. They're saying, we've got to get going. we got to get going. I said, what's the matter? And all of a sudden there were, it had to be 20 or 30 young men. They had obviously run through the gym made some racist remarks or some smart aleck remarks that got these guys going who were now chasing them into the alley. And uh, so that is, so I turned around and that's what I saw. And so they had blocked the exit to the alley. We were backed up against the bus and I had these kids behind me and I was in the middle of that between the two of them. And they started throwing uh you know, the boys that had come out of the gym started throwing uh, bottles, and rocks, and whatever they could get to throw. And uh, and thank goodness, I was kind of a crazy man myself back in those days. And you know, they almost hit me with a rock, so I, I just got, I just kind of blacked out. Got got um, got angry, grabbed a couple of rocks, threw it right at the middle of that group. I didn't know where anybody else was, and I just headed straight for the middle of them. Now, it obviously hit somebody with a rock when it went through, but that group of young men dispersed in five seconds. You couldn't find them. They were just gone. And uh, and that was lucky. I mean, somebody was watching over me at that point. (laughs) Yeah, I was about to say, because that that sounds like another scene in the movie. I'm trying to picture that scene. But when the young men that you were your group uh that you were defending right did, did they really see that <clears throat> see that as like a change of heart moment like you know what maybe this guy's not that bad you know maybe we should they did listen to him. you know because they understood that that was their lifestyle they understood what was involved there and when we got on that bus man they were just partying they just could not contain themselves it was just pooping and hollering and yelling and and I definitely, you know, raised my respect level with them uh, several notches. After that point, they knew that I had their back, no matter who it was that was coming at them. So uh, that was important to them because most of these kids didn't know their parents. Some had never had parents. Um, and they, they, and I, I always say this when I talk about this, they did not know what love looked like, real love, right? Somebody really concerned about their well-being, cared about them, talked to them about it. Um, They didn't know what that looked like. So what it looked like, the first inkling of that they got was when I protected them from this group. Then they said, well, what was that all about? Why why is he doing that? And so it was something they had to mull over. and They came to the realization that I did care about them. Between that and tracking them down and you know, listening to their, their stories and, uh, you know, and we were definitely a family. And we we were out in the woods for a year and a half. We had to build our own shelters. We had to dig our own outhouse pit. Uh, we had to, you know, we did a, we had to build a bunkhouse. We built it all from the local trees, right? We cut down the trees and we'd, we'd uh, cut off the branches and we'd build the bunkhouse. The, and so in that effort, you know, it's really like a tribe working together towards the same goal. And uh, and they just love that. I mean, it got to a point where if I left for a week, um, I came back, they'd all be waiting for me at the top of the hill, jump in the back of my truck. And, you know, where are we going to go next? And so... Um, and so there was a there there was a, a, a sad part of that story that I still kind of blame myself for, which was uh, there was a young man who came 
later than the others did, really to replace the leader who had been taken out of the group. And he was, and they, I kept hearing the kids talk about him. He's a troublemaker. Everybody hates him, blah, blah, blah. So he comes in the bus, and again, somebody throws him out of the bus, and he's just a bag of rags, and he's just a little, little black guy. You know, not he's he couldn't have been more than 120 pounds, and I don't know, five feet tall or something. There just wasn't much to him, and they just picked on him relentlessly. And at some point during that, there's something that happened at camp. And, and once we got control of the boys, we'd let them go to the movies or, you know, with supervision. And so he and I stayed back one night. And in that one night, he and I just became fast friends. Uh, you know, we talked. I he wanted horseback rides around the camp. Uh, and I tickled him. I, and the first smile I ever saw on his face. And the brightest smile I've ever seen on anybody's face came from that little boy because I don't think he'd smiled in years. Uh, And he could feel the way I felt about him. And the problem with that was, and so I had to protect him from everybody and I protected all of them from each other. But um, after I left, so the last trip we had was a canoe trip down a, a, you know, a river in Arkansas and there was a flash flood and all kinds of stuff happened. We almost lost a boy. We didn't. But they, the, after I left, the other group took Jerome, this little boy and his name. And, uh, one of the, uh, one of my, you know, my boys in my group called me about a year after it was six months after the, um, uh, the last river trip that I was on. And he said, you know, uh, Jerome died on the river trip. And I said, well, how did that happen? He said, well, two boys that had always been after him, took him up and threw him off a cliff into the river. And, uh, and I said, I, you know, cause I knew that. So I felt so bad because I had left him there vulnerable, you know, but so that's that's my uh, sad story about <laughs> about wow. me being there. Man, this yeah. sounds like it needs to be a uh, a movie. Uh, now I know once again I'm a plug the book. People can go to your website uh, wjpbooks.com and they can find Wolf Creek anywhere you get a book. You get on Amazon. We're listening to Army Focus Radio talking to he said I can call him Bill. So I'm gonna say Bill. We're talking to Bill about this, but. Man, this is like, it sounds like a movie. And your son, who is uh, a writer himself, he kind of helped you uh, put this book together. So for the audience real quick, while we still have you on, kind of touch on uh, what your son was able to do to help you get this book published. All right. So, um, you know, I, I had been told you need to, because I told a lot of people the story, they said, you really need to write that down and because that, that could be a good book. And so I did that. I did it longhand on a yellow pad and I wrote the whole thing out. And then I had, back in those days, there weren't computers and word processing things. So I had somebody type it up for me. And uh, I, I, I didn't know, I mean, that's the first book I'd ever written. So I didn't know about the formatting and all the stuff that needed to be done. I sent it to a publisher, a well-known publisher in Boston, and they looked at it and they got back to me and they said, you know, this is really an amazing story, but you're not much of a writer. <laughs> wow. I know. <laughs> so, you know, like I said, what do you do with that? All right. So what you do is you put it in the closet. And I happen to have one of my sons who was interested in writing. He got a creative writing degree. And I said, look, Joe, I got, I've got this manuscript, man. Would you look at it and see if you could turn it into something that was, um, you know, more readable? And so that's what he did for me. He spent six months on it. I paid him to do it. And uh, and he, you know, he really turned it into something that is, is uh, easy to read and gets all the uh, emotional part in that. Yeah, because just hearing everything you talk about with your experience working with those young men, like, man, this needs to be a movie or a TV series because it's it's very interesting, very intriguing. And I have to ask you, 
uh, the job that he's working as a counselor for for the these young these young men. I mean, did that grow to become more like highlighted, like more exposure for you know the success rate, or just like because I can only imagine you know just with your story with your experience with the young man that there's probably more stories with this program. So how popular is that program? Well, you know, I think back in those days, again, the 60s, 70s, people were trying all kinds of new ways of living and approaching life and all that stuff. And um, and as far as I know, now, what I think happened was after Jerome was killed, died in the river instance, I think they had to abandon that program. Uh-huh. Because there was a certain amount of danger involved in what we did. Uh, when I was on the canoe trip, we almost lost a young man um, because there was a flash flood. We didn't know about it. You know, there's no, no radios and all the flash flood comes up in five minutes. And all of a sudden, the level of the river is 10, 15 feet higher than it was. Yeah. And you're and you're stuck out in the middle of nowhere. And nobody knows where you are. So it's really, uh, you know, you have to. but. At the end of the day, I think all of those boys got, number one, some, um, their self-image certainly improved, improved because of everything they were able to do. Mm-hmm. I mean, they weren't, you know, a lot of those boys couldn't read. They couldn't tell time. They just hadn't been in the school system long enough to learn any of those things. And um, and so I tried to... Uh, you know, I tried to just show them my love as much as I could and, and get them to trust me, which they did. Um, and I trusted them. So, um, you know, I think it was a great program, but it's just you couldn't do it. I don't think you could be allowed to do it <laughs> nowadays. Yeah, no, especially in today's yeah, climate. Yeah, you just couldn't. But, you know, when you think about the concept of putting these wild and and I know somebody has called them uh, not alley cats, but uh, whatever it is you have. Yeah. Yeah. Putting them someplace where they could actually get mad, run around, you know, do things where they're not hurting each other, but also building something. I mean, they were proud. That was quite a camp that we built and they did that all themselves. And then we took trips all over the country with these guys so and we ran into a lot of racial kind of things especially when we were in texas mm-hmm. you know we'd want to go wash our clothes someplace and the, the white owner would say uh, you know so this was back when they still had the signs up whites only and you can come in but you know the black kids can't i said well it, it didn't work that way with us so Man, in that particular tell me i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off no go uh, ahead this Someone has to make this book a movie, man, because like it, I literally can see this like in different scenes as you're describing. But go ahead, man. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, that's all right. But the interesting part about that was there's a young girl there that said, look, I know a place they'll let you do your clothes. And it was back. And, and in those days, there were two sides of the track. There's the black side and the white side. So she said, you just need to come over to this other side and they'll let you. And we did. You know, we went over, went into the laundromat. They didn't, they treated us just all equally. Um, so, that, but that was a kind of a recurring problem with these boys was that, uh, and there is some racial strife between them. You know, the N word was thrown, thrown around liberally. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, that's but, a good thing to point out. A uh, quick question, if you don't mind me jumping in. When you were having uh, these young men together, were they actually, you know, staying together, you know, you know, as far as activities, you know, living, all that stuff? Or were they separated or were you really trying to bring the idea that we're going to do this as a unit? Well, we, you know, we did a combination of that. We first went out there, they would sleep just on the ground someplace or on top of the bus or inside the bus. Mm -hmm. And I said, this is not going to work for the winter. So we built the bunkhouse and we were all in the bunkhouse together. And then after they'd been in that, the spring came, they, some of them would want to go out and they'd pitch a tent. They wanted to live in the tent. They'd still come back to the cookhouse and to the bunkhouse. But uh, we let them have as much freedom as we could under the circumstances 
And once they knew the rules about you don't hurt anybody, and and the other rule was you don't lie to me, don't be lying to me, because I don't want that. I don't want to hear it. I don't want to have it. Either there's trust here or there's not. Uh, But, you know, it was, I I really learned more than they did. I learned more from them than they learned from me. Just their spirit, you know, the spirit can't be broken, no matter what you do to them, how much you beat them up, how, how many times you throw them in jail, how many times you pistol whip them. Uh, they're just coming back strong and they appreciated somebody who cared about them. And, you know, we had one incident just very quickly because they hadn't had families. I uh, took them home on Christmas and my family was not wealthy. It never had been. Hmm. My dad and mother lived in a one bedroom apartment. And uh, so here I am coming with 12 boys for Christmas dinner. And um and my mother had always wanted four boys, so she loved boys. So she was in heaven. I mean, she had, what, you know, 12, 13 boys <laughs> in her house that she could sew their patches on their hats for them and talk to them, and, you know. So, and, and they, I still have pictures of that. And they, they're sitting there. One of the boys was sitting on my dad's lap. I mean, my dad would never let me sit on his lap. I'm thinking, whoa, what? <laughs> what's going on here? And, uh, you know, talking to my mom and having their presence. And uh, so that was pretty cool. I, I still look at that picture every day. And I think that's a good point to to illustrate in this in this uh, conversation. Uh, it sounds like these young men, they, they were just, they were in a bad spot. Uh, they were unwanted by their parents, the system. And yep. they each had their own... Uh, uh, issue that they were dealing with personally. They did. When and you... some of them didn't like each other, like any, you know, like yeah. brothers yeah. sometimes. When you uh, moved on from that job, were you able to keep in touch with any one of them or hear any success uh, story from one of them by someone, you know, growing up to being productive or anything like that? Or was it just more like you just kind of kept those thoughts and, you know, now you have this opportunity to share the world, you know? The- no, I, I had a couple of them that called me back and talked to me. One of them was up in one of the smaller guys. I was always getting picked on. I, it, obviously, he'd grown up. He told me he was wrestling bears in, uh, in Wisconsin. And um, Another one uh, wanted me to meet his girlfriend and another one just called just to see how I was doing. So, but this was a time again where there weren't any cell phones, there wasn't any internet, there wasn't any email. So mm-hmm. once I left, yeah, yeah, it was difficult for them to even know where I was. Is that, and yeah. uh, I did, you know, I got out of school with a degree in zoology. And, um, and when I, Finished with those boys, I went and got a master's in social work. So, and and in so I'd already been exposed to, um, um, you know, crisis intervention kind of work. So I went to work for the American Red Cross and their disaster services program, and I traveled all over the uh, halfway around the world and all over the United States wherever there was a disaster. You know, giving aid to um, to people. So. You know, that got me into my first uh, first professional career. <laughs> Man, it was, it was one heck of a start <laughs> because... Uh, it is a good start. It, it, it's unbelievable. I mean, a lot of people say, no, you're, just, you're exaggerating, you're lying. But no, no I didn't. No, yeah. I wasn't. But it is an... Un- Looking back at it from today, right, it looks like an unbelievable story. No, they wouldn't let you do that. No, that didn't happen. But it did. I mean, in that time period, I, I wouldn't be too shocked. <laughs> it definitely would right. happen in today's time, but yeah, I can I can only imagine in that time period that um, there was probably a lot more opportunities to <laughs> to try to things. do that kind of yeah to try new stuff. Yeah, and that's what that's what the sixties seventies are all about. Hey, we're going to try something <laughs> new here, right? So let's try this. <laughs> and these were you know I had to see it. They were disposable kids. Hmm. Nobody cared about me, really. Yeah. And your book, Nobody is, did. your book is illustrating the power of of uh, opportunity to look past those things where 
they, you know, these are, these are individuals with, you know, broken pieces, if you will. Right. And it sounds like you're, you're making this, this book detailing the opportunities that you were able to share with them to hopefully plant a good seed in each and every one of them to, uh, you know, have a better end, if you will. Right. Well, they, you know, what they really got from it was an increase in self-respect, self-esteem, and self-confidence. And that's all they needed. Nobody ever gave them that, that opportunity before because they were told they weren't, they weren't any good. Nobody wanted them, including their parents. And that's a hard message to swallow, right? So at least when they were out in the woods, nobody was telling them that. And they were doing things on their own. I mean, they built a camp. They survived, uh, you know, a lot of, um, like I say, they, the uh, flash flood and some other incidents we had. They survived those things. And as a result, they get stronger, like all of us. You know, we meet some obstacle, we overcome it, and we feel better about ourselves. It gives us more confidence. That's what that whole thing was about, was really increasing their self-esteem, their confidence, so that they could go out into the world. And these same boys that uh, in the beginning couldn't even tell time or read, or at the end of it, they were saying, I remember they asked me on a bus ride some some point, they said, you know, Bill, you went to college, didn't you? I said, yeah, I went to college. and 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 it almost made me cry. They said, do you think we could go to college? Do you think we could ever go to college? Wow. And I said, of course. And so that's kind of a, a flash, that's a awesome. photo of the difference, right, between the beginning and the end. Yeah, it's like a spark, you know. Sometimes a uh, person just need that, that extra opportunity for someone to kind of show them, yeah, it's going to take you being responsible for yourself, but I'm going yeah. to help you learn your way through this opportunity and to know somebody cares about them yeah man man great man Did, i know we went over time but this is way worth the time because man uh y'all need to get this book wolf creek and get it on amazon or you can go to uh, the website is wjpbooks.com been talking to he said i can call him bill so we've been talking to bill but you know, William Pardue and his son Patrick Pardue, uh, they put this very well written written book that I think everyone should go check out. And man, I seriously, I think this can be a movie, man. Because like, I don't know if you've seen uh, the movie Holes. No. Okay, but uh, it's it's basically a it's a movie as. I'll say it for another time, but it, it's, it kind of reminded me of the movie Holes a bit. Yeah, because, I have to look that up. Yeah, because, uh, yeah, we'll talk after the show. But, man, the point is people need to get this book, Wolf Creek, because, uh, yeah, that sounds like an amazing story to to witness and, and to, to just really look at. I have actually this last question. When you became a counselor <laughs> for that job, did she had any idea that you'd be able to make an impact on someone's life as far as those individuals that you were um, responsible for? No, you know, because I was young myself. Yeah. I just went out there thinking, you know what? It's just a job. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, not just a job, but I went out there thinking I'm going to do, because somebody's put me here to do this, I'm going to do the best I can do. I'm just going to be myself. I'm a nice guy. I had a big heart, hmm. you know, uh, as a family guy I wanted to protect my family, even though my brother was trying to kill me, I'd protect them. Anybody came after him, I'd be there. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the chemistry that they needed in somebody and somebody who believed in them. And I came up through, you know, uh, the ranks of the poor and, and that's no fun. Yeah. And, you know, you get, um, but it teaches you a lot of hard lessons and they needed somebody who had been, who had learned a lot of hard lessons. Man, awesome, man. Man, it sounds like you just making a movie throughout the whole conversation. I didn't want to say nothing. <laughs> you was doing a great <laughs> job just uh, telling the story. I, I think this is uh, very needed. I, I, I think a lot of times when people have stories, sometimes they they don't try to get it out there. But with the help of your son, you being able to yeah. get this book written, and I think that's really good, man. Well, I had a, uh, you know, the one thing that kind of, sold me on trying to get you know this 
this book. And, and we are trying at this point to get a, a movie made on it. I have some uh, folks that are helping me. Uh, so my older brother calls me back at, at night. And this was, you know, a few years ago. And he's, uh, he's uh, always a quiet guy, first in the family, very conservative. And he's crying. He's crying on the phone. I thought, oh, my God, who died? What happened here? I says, what's, up? what's wrong? He says, I, uh, I just finished your book. And he just could not, he, he, he couldn't say a word. All he could do was sob. Wow. And so it's, a, it's that kind of a book. So for some people, I've, I've had them read it. And they said, well, wow, that's a rough read just because of what's happening. So, you know, I didn't um, put any lipstick on anything. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just the way it's written is the way it happened. Wow. Well, there you go, man. That, that, was, that was a great way to, uh, to wrap up this, this discussion, man. Once again, man, we're talking to, to Bill. He said I can say that, but uh, go to his website, be William Pardue and his son, uh, Patrick. You can go to the website, wjpbooks.com, and get the book Wolf Creek. It's on Amazon, and he also has other books that you can uh, definitely check out and read. So, man, I want to say thank you again taking time talking uh, Army Focus Radio. And man, when that movie actually <laughs> comes out, hopefully we can have you back on so you can talk about it, man. Yeah. Well, thank you for listening to my diatribe here going on and on. Because uh, once I start, it's hard for me to stop. But I appreciate you giving me that time. 